How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, today I'm going to be doing a reaction video on the history of Australia from Swebna. They're a YouTube channel. They do a lot of animation. Some of their stuff is really good. Uh, a lot of their older stuff on the history of different countries is really good. And uh, I felt that Australia, a place that I'm going to be visiting probably in the next year, would be a great video to do a little bit of reaction on the history of Australia. So without further ado, let's get rolling. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first 500 viewers who sign up using the link below get two months of Skillshare absolutely free. Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Macrobius believed that there was far too much land in the Northern Hemisphere and that there must be some undiscovered continent balancing the globe somewhere in the south. Okay, so the logic was a little flawed, but during the Age of Discovery, the search was on for Terra Australis Incognito. Fast forward a few centuries to the East Indies. Three Dutch sailors landed in Australia accidentally in the 1600s. The mythical southern continent had just been found. One of the really cool things about Australia is just how far away it is. I know the people in Australia and New Zealand kind of like love that, but uh, it's kind of cool how like in the world we just circumnavigated the globe uh, for centuries and then they found it only about uh, a little over 400 years ago. Now, granted, there were Aborigines that lived there and people that are native to uh, Australia, but I'm talking about Europeans. Only found it about 400 years ago in the history of mankind. It was pretty cool. Australia was the last of the new world to be discovered, because let's be honest, nobody cares about Antarctica. Australia was of course already inhabited, indigenous Australians also Nobody cares about Antarctica, but if you if you'll see now that on social media, there's tons of people that are booking trips to Antarctica. I thought about it myself. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I can't get uh, my better half to go with me because she doesn't like the cold that much. But anyway, uh, Antarctica is now becoming kind of popular with tourism. Also known as it had a population of between 300 and 700,000 by modern estimates. Early contacts with these tribes were as often peaceful as they were violent. It is thought that these groups arrived in two stages. The first was from the Indian subcontinent via a land bridge that connected Australia to the island of New Guinea, bringing with them the Pama Nyuangan language family. The second wave was much later and may have been groups related to the Austronesians of Indonesia. Their culture... It's interesting that they talk about a land bridge uh, because that's the same idea that they use for North America, like the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, that there was a land bridge from Asia. So it's kind of interesting all this plate tectonics and the shifting of, of ground and stuff allowed people to move around the world and it's i did not know that i was today years old when i found this out and history was preserved through the oral tradition the dutch named the island new holland after the county of holland in the netherlands but it wasn't until the british landed on the east coast and named it new south wales that europeans began to settle landing in port jackson on the 26th of january 1788 Hey, that's today. The so-called First Fleet arrived to found the colony of Sydney, with the intention of using the labour of prisoners to achieve wealth for Britain. However, contrary to Australia's convict founding myth, less than half of this First Fleet were actually convicts. In the 1800s, Australia was circumnavigated, mapped, and new colonies started springing up. I always um, enjoy listening to people from Australia. They say, uh, that their ancestors came to Australia because they were a pickpocket or a petty thief and they were wrongly accused and stuck on a boat um, and sent to Australia. Uh, I, I don't know how true that is. I mean, there are more criminals than pickpockets and every family has one in their closet. So it's kind of interesting that uh, all the Australians I've ever met always say that, you know, that their ancestors were removed from Ireland or England and sent there because they were a pickpocket somewhere in London or Dublin up all over hobart newcastle launceston port macquarie brisbane and melbourne with dozens of penal centers adelaide and perth were founded as free settlement cities but the latter was made into a penal colony after it failed to grow naturally as the europeans expanded the frontier wars began with the aboriginals many of whom were hostile to the foreign invaders most famously the black war of tasmania which nearly wiped out the indigenous tasmanians 
but far more destructive to the aboriginals was smallpox, which killed tens of thousands. Uh, that's something you really don't hear much about. The uh, war with the the uh, natives, the aboriginals, and the uh, the settlers from Europe. Uh, you don't really hear much about that. I'm sure if you live in Australia, you're probably educated a little bit more than the rest of the world. Uh, as far as the smallpox thing goes, yeah, that that's that's huge. That that happened not only in Australia but also happened in North America, South America. Uh, a lot of these people that were indigenous were not immune to these European type of diseases, and it it wiped entire civilizations out. Uh, people don't. You know, we had COVID not that long ago where people were, you know, concerned about the percentage of people being killed by COVID. But at this time, um, you know, it was much worse because we didn't even have uh, really good medicine at that point. Australia's growth would stagnate until the 1850s gold rush, which drew hundreds and thousands of settlers from all around the world in search for wealth particularly in New South Wales and what would become Victoria. This would forever change Australia's character, with new free settlers overshadowing its convict past. 1850s, a gold rush. Just like in the United States, we had a gold rush in the late 1840s, 1850s. Uh, gold fever was all over the place in the uh, 19th century. You see it in Alaska, you see it in Asia, you see it in Africa, you see it all over the place. Uh, gold... The rumor of gold always gets a lot of people willing to take a chance. However, most people that are searching for gold wind up broke, and the person that sells the shovels is actually the one that makes the money. Bringing with them the ideas of European enlightenment, the American self-determinism, and the Chinese hatred for the British? These gold diggers became discontent with the corrupt and badly run colonial elites and rose up in rebellion in the infamous Eureka Stockade. These settlers were beginning to feel a sense of nationalism that perhaps Australia could be something different. The winds of change were on Terra Australis, and soon large-scale trade unions developed in Australia's largely working-class population from the ideas of orthodox Marxists. Trade unions still hold a significant influence over Australian politics today. But let's not forget the rift that had been forming between Australia and Australians, the government and its people. Thousands of ex-convicts were being released each year, most of them turning to civil jobs, but a sizable minority turned to Australia's bushy frontier for freedom and profits. Policing was harsh, but... What, are, what do they call Australia? Like the donut? Uh, around the outside of Australia, the perimeter is almost all the population, and in the middle is hardly anything it's it's a it's a it's a wild country um, i mean i'm not saying nobody lives in the middle there's definitely natives that live in the middle and there's and there's other people but uh yeah it's it's like the donut i think they call it and uh it's very interesting it's one of the last really wild places on planet earth order couldn't reach far enough outside of the cities only personal gain and wealth could drive law enforcement money would change hands and lips were sealed in this climate, an Australian icon was born, Ned Kelly. Famous for his tin hat Robin Hood thievery, infamous for his cop killing and town raids, and recognisable everywhere for that nifty bulletproof suit. From I guess with Ned Kelly, it's kind of like our Billy the Kid or uh, Jesse James. Uh, it's interesting that it's in, in that same time period, the Wild West and Australia. And Australia did have a history with firearms at one point, but in the late 90s, they know... They surrendered their rights to firearms, but it was just as, you know, from what I understand, it was just as prevalent in Australia with firearms as the United States. More on one of the most well-known cornerstones of Australian folklore, come to my channel, Feature History, and check out my video on Old Ned. Okay, so besides bulletproof suits or whatever, most Aussie colonies were granted self-governing status and united to form the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901, a dominion of the British Crown. The new Australian government was very quick to open up a new dark chapter in Aboriginal history, the infamous Stolen Generation. Beginning in 1905, the government began rounding up half-castes, a term which is now highly offensive, and settled them into white families with the intention of breeding out their Aboriginal blood. In a f and this also happened in the United States, um, close to the same time, maybe a little bit earlier, where we had in the United States, they had what they were called Indian schools, and they were doing away with uh, people's past uh, traditions, beliefs, and trying to educate them more in a European uh, light. I know the Carlisle uh, Indian School in Pennsylvania was pretty big, and apparently Australia also 
had something pretty close to this. A form of cultural genocide. Abuses of these children were also rampant, which is a rather depressing segue into the White Australia policy, a set of strict settlement acts which restricted immigration from anyone who wasn't British or Northern European up until about the Second World War. As a British colony, Australia would unilaterally declare war on Germany during the First World War, forming the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZACs. The now, from what I understand, Australia has an offensive army to this day, and New Zealand has a defensive army, kind of like uh, <coughs> kind of like Japan, only has a defensive army. Uh, so I know that the ANZAC troops saw a lot of combat. There was a Mel Gibson movie that came out in the early 80s about uh, the First World War and Australian troops. If you get a chance to go watch it, uh, it's, it's really cool. It's a great, great early Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson movie, but uh, yeah, Anzacs are are something familiar to me as a military historian. I've definitely I've definitely heard this term before. And Anzacs were pretty brave, and there was even Australians, uh, you know, and New Zealanders fought in the Second World War. But a lot of people don't realize that Australia also fought in the Korean War and the United States. And a little trivia fact that there has not been a war since 1900 that the United States has not gone into that Australia has not been by their side. Pretty, pretty uh, loyal, um, loyal ally there. Young Nation was sent headfirst into war. Around half a million soldiers volunteered, or nearly one-tenth of the total population. The baptism of fire came during the Gallipoli campaign, when more than 8,000 men lost their lives in the failed invasion of Turkey, an event etched into the memory of the Australian zeitgeist. Although crippled from the Great Depression, Australia again took up arms in 1939 to support her mother nation in the Second World War this time fighting in Europe, North Africa, the Pacific, and South Asia. Prisoners of war in Malaya, Burma, and Thailand were treated inhumanely by the Japanese, who also bombed Australia's northern coast about a hundred. And that's one thing that people fail to recognize. When we talk about the Second World War, we talk about Europe, we talk about uh, Japan, we talk about even Pearl Harbor, the United States, China getting attacked. But people don't realize that how close this war was to the people of Australia. Uh, and there were American troops stationed in Australia. My grandfather, um, my father's father, who was in the Marines in the Pacific, was in Australia for a point um, during his uh, training purposes before he went to Iwo Jima. So pretty interesting. But again, it's this is a forgotten part of the war, maybe not by the Australians, but by the rest of the world, that this war was that close to them. And even, uh, you know, they had some issues with the Japanese attacking them directly. hundred times. Australia is still a very young nation, but it has emerged a very powerful force in the region, now a beacon of democracy, social progressivism and commerce, with its phenomenal urbanization consistently ranked among the world's most livable cities. Walking the line between left and right with generous social programs, universal suffrage, a welcoming immigration policy and attractive business prospects. This is John. John wants to learn how to play the didgeridoo he bought from a garage sale, but the lessons are expensive so John will probably give up. But wait, John, you can learn for free over at Skillshare. In just 17 minutes with Paul Carlos, you can take a beginner's course in the didgeridoo. I, I might sign up to take that class. I always thought they were the really cool, cool one of the coolest sounding uh, instruments. Skillshare is an online learning platform where you can learn a new skill with more than 20,000 courses in design, business, technology, and more. John's friend Sally wants to learn how to animate a kangaroo. So why not this lesson on After Effects by Kurtzkosakt? And the great part is it's all going to be absolutely free for two months for the first 500 viewers who sign up using the link below. John and Sally made the right choice. Join them in just minutes a day to learn a new skill. Support the show on Patreon to vote for the next episode or download some of the artwork used in the videos. Thank you for watching. Until next time. So if you get a chance, go on over and subscribe to these guys. I thought the... Uh... The video was very well good, uh, very well done. It's a it's a thirty thousand mile view of the history of Australia. Obviously, there is a um, a lot more to history in Australia than than this. And if you get a chance, go out and check these guys' website out. Also, go to our uh, page and like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to tell all your friends about us. Comment below if there's a channel that you'd like me to do a reaction video on based on history. Please leave it below, and I will take a look at it. See if it's something I can put together for you and get out there. Until next time, have a great one.